everybody. How are you guys tonight? Woohoo! Happy Thursday to the Bucket Filler Brigade. I thought about that today. I decided you guys are all bucket fillers, and I kind of like the Bucket Filler Brigade. That's who you are. You fill people's buckets with wonder and joy, and I just love hanging out with you on Thursday. Yeah, so instead of BFFs, we have BFBs. <laughs> Anyway, um, you guys, hi. Well, let's see who's hanging out. Linda's here. She popped in first. She turned on the lights. Um, there's Larry. Yay. And Angie's here too. Larry and Angie came to the party. Madonna did. And Lupe's here. Hi, Lupe. Oh, yes. Nice. Lots of people checking in. Bucket filling time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So you guys, uh, today, woo, I started my, uh, my watercolor class this morning. So it started at 1030, um, up at the mustard seed project, which is about a 20, 20 minutes door to door. Um, <laughs> I think I got the video done for today and posted and, and the scheduling done at like 9.45. And I had been up since seven and I did a bunch of stuff on creative work hour and some other things and I got it all done. I was very pleased, got it all. And then, and, and Bob was in Seattle today um, at Mauer. So, um, and then I thought, woohoo, I've got time. I'll make it up there. I got a call from them about what to bring and stuff. And, and then I started to go upstairs and there's Aldo sitting there looking at me like, are we going for a walk? Are you going to ignore me? Dad's gone. What about me? And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Although, yes, okay. So he and I made the fastest walk around the block, <laughs> around the little neighborhood, with literally an eight-minute <laughs> down, 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 <laughs> so that he could get out and that I could get out by grab all my stuff and get out by 10 after 10 and make it up to watercolor class, which was absolutely fabulous. And, um, it was just fun until I start to learn some things. And then, um, it's, it, it's where my, uh, photographs are on display too. So that was kind of fun. Everybody that was in the class came around and then looked at those afterwards. And then there's a new little, uh, kind of snack bar opened up at the senior snack bar at the at the mustard seed and it's open from 10 to 2 every day and they make like homemade soups and hom these beautiful salads and for like two dollars for a cup of soup seriously and it's it just the people are, are wonderful fun so a bunch of us sat and had lunch and uh it got posted on the two waters instagram as it was the biggest crowd they'd had they were like five of us sitting around a table having a good time. So it was a good day. And then I came home and I did some more painting and just about, and Bob got home and about mm, five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, I said, Oh, I, I better go get ready for, for the show, <laughs> but it's here. So yay. Uh, what, Oh, is the, um, uh, you, Oh, you were first today. <laughs> Listening to Kate Smith, perfect timing. Okay, cool. I'm just checking. Is my, am I, um, I just see the notifications. <laughs> um, so today I have two authors, I mean, two, uh, two artists to talk about. In the second book, we have the delight of having the, the story, the illustrator of the story actually being who the story's about. He is still alive and, uh, and able to just, we'll get to that one. But the first one, yeah, I don't think many of you, uh, if you're from the United States, you know, now Tamara, when she gets here, I don't know if she knows, although I bet she probably does. I am most people. Anybody else here of my generation, <laughs> possibly. My mother subscribed to the New Yorker magazine. And one of the things that I loved 
was as if Small Child was going through the New Yorker magazine and looking at it and seeing the covers. Well, first I would go through the New Yorker looking for the comics. They always had these cool little little um, cartoons. And it was one of the earliest first things I learned to read. But also looking at the cover art and at the art on the inside and at the stories. And so many times they were done by Norman Rockwell. And I really didn't know a whole lot about who he was or anything about his life. And I found this book called Hello, Hi, I'm Norman. <laughs> and it's the story of American illustrator Norman Rockwell. And it's just, it's really kind of cool. So um, I'm going to tell you first, Robert Burley is the author. He's an award-winning author of many books for children, including Hoops, oh, which is a great book. Uh, illustrated by Stephen T. Johnson, and um, he lives with his wife in Michigan. And Wendell Miner is the illustrator. He's a trustee emeritus at, of the Norman Rockwell Museum and the award-winning illustrator of dozens of picture books. He collaborated with Robert Burley on Night Flight, Amelia Earhart, Across the Sea Atlantic, and um, all kinds of he, Mr. Miner's work can be found in the permanent collection of the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art. Yes, it can be. And the Library of Congress. He lives with his wife, Florence, in Connecticut. Visit him at minerart.com. So, yes, I thought I knew I'd seen Wendell Miner's stuff when I was at the Eric Carle Picture Book Museum. So this first book I'm going to read is called Hi, I'm Norman. But first, let's so check in in. Yeah. Anybody else ever? I mean, that was, that was one of the things on, on Sundays. Okay. We, if we got back after we got back from church, there was the Sunday funnies. There was the New Yorker. If a new one came in and those were the things that I would, I would, mom would be getting dinner ready and whatnot. And I would have been outside, but I would, I can, I can remember vividly, um, the way our house, our house faced west, and the, or the dining room faced west, but the uh, living room window, big window, faced south. And so by the time we got back from church, and because church was <laughs> a 40-minute drive <laughs> into Yakima, and came home, and after we'd done everything, and mom was getting dinner ready, I would stretch out on the floor in the sun with either the Sunday Funnies or the New Yorker and read and go through that or one of my other books. But that was oftentimes where I was. So this, I'm delighted to bring this book to you guys. I think you're going to like it. It's called, Hi, I'm Norman. And I just, the illustrations go so well with the style of Norman Rockwell. Yay. The story of an American illustrator, Norman Rockwell. And the um, pictures are done, I just read this, are done in gouache. Where did I see it? Da -da -da -da. Are rendered in watercolor, gouache, and pencil. Yay. Good. I think you guys can see it well enough. Brighter, a little brighter, and saturation will do. There. Hi, I'm Norman, Norman Rockwell. Come on in. This is my studio. Here's the easel where I paint, and there are paints, the brushes, my chair, and the walls hung with sketches. You name it. I love it here. Every artist loves being in the studio. I close the door behind me and enter my own special world because art is my life and has been for as long as I can remember. Of course, I haven't always had a nice studio like this one. No, not at all. There I am, a little kid, after dinner, at the dining room table drawing while my dad reads me David Copperfield. 
I loved listening to his calm, soft voice. Slowly, the characters came alive in my mind. Does that ever happen to you? I bent forward, biting my lip, erasing and starting again, until I captured the people and the scenes I heard there on paper in front of me. Even way back then, I loved telling stories with pictures, and still do, but our dining room wasn't my only studio in those days. Sometimes I had a much bigger one. My outdoor studio, the street. I wasn't much of a ball player, mm -mm. but when I drew, things changed. The guys in the neighborhood liked me. Draw us a picture, Norm. I'd grab a piece of chalk from my pocket, kneel down on the sidewalk, and before you knew it, there was a picture of a big lion's head or one of Admiral Dewey's battleships or maybe a fire truck being pulled by horses. I'll show you up close if I can. Look at some of the... Uh, look at that. Shows how he's drawing. I love that. Everyone would yell, do one more. <laughs> and look at that. And the truth is my ability was just something I had, like the color of my hair or eyes. Now my older brother Jarvis could jump over three orange crates. Me, I could draw. Oh, I nearly forgot, <laughs> grade school. Uh, I'll be the first to confess that I wasn't all that good at paying attention. But drawing was different. And lucky for me, my favorite teacher gave me lots of opportunity. I sometimes filled the whole blackboard with holiday scenes or pictures of covered wagons rumbling through a far-off snow-capped mountain. I admit I was pretty darn proud when Miss Smith said with a smile, Norman's drawn something we've been reading about. Settlers heading west on the Oregon Trail. Oh, my classmates let out a big, ooh. That was great to hear. But art school, oh, a few years later, wasn't always as easy. I can still picture the room where the art students worked. The gray light drifting down through the skylights. The smudged walls, the floors littered with rags and hardened paint. But who cared? If you love something, you take the bad with it too, right? I still remember things my teacher told me. Step over the frame, Norman, and live in the picture. Feel the picture hard, Rockwell, and the public will feel it the same way. Now and then, my favorite instructor would walk by and correct my drawing by scrawling a big thick charcoal line through something I thought was perfect. Ouch! That hurt. But I listened and I learned and I got better and better. I even won a prize in illustration class. You might say I entered art school raw and came out cooked. It was time to test myself in the real world, and believe me, I wanted to pass the test. This wasn't a job I wouldn't, there wasn't a job I wouldn't accept. I drew Santas and angels for Christmas booklets. I drew body parts for medical texts. I illustrated children's books too. I was a young, struggling artist, and every smidgen helped. Whatever I did, I did my best. I painted 100% in gold at the top of my easel. Every time I began a picture, I was determined that it would be perfect. <laughs> Funny, but sometimes felt I was chasing and at the same time being chased. Chasing my dream of becoming a great artist, but also being chased by the fear that I wasn't good enough. Was I? I was 
22 years old. And ready or not, I decided to find out. The Saturday Evening Post was the most popular magazine in America. And every week an artist had his or her illustration, a picture story smack dab on the cover. I decided to go to the Post's office. I remember sitting and fidgeting in the waiting room while the editor was inside looking over a few of my pictures. Was I nervous? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> My heart was pounding like a sledgehammer. Finally, the door swung open and out came Mr. Dower. I was almost afraid to look up. We'll take all five of these, he said simply. I just gulped. For a moment, I couldn't find my words. I was that overjoyed. My paintings on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post and $75 for each one? Wow! Over the years, I did 300 plus covers for the post, which is a lot of ideas to come up with. And doing covers is doubly hard because a cover has to tell the whole story in one picture. And the viewer has to get it at first glance. Bingo! Just like that. How do I get ideas? Well, I doodle. <laughs> Ever try it? It's my way of brainstorming. I let my mind wander as I scratch out a funny little picture one after another. Maybe it comes up a dog, the bit later perhaps a person, a hungry man. Then after some more pictures the dog is chasing him. Hmm. <laughs> more doodling. Perhaps the man is carrying something the dog wants. What could it be? Hey, it's a fresh baked pie. Now I see it, the picture story. A tramp is running away, carrying a pie he's just stolen, and a hungry pup is barking after him. Arf, arf. In fact, that's one of my post covers. I called it, guess what? Dog biting man in the seat of the pants. <laughs> Before I start my painting, I always set up the whole scene to look just as it will in the final picture. I search hard for models, too. Adult models and even kid models are fairly easy. At least you can talk to them. But how about animals? <laughs> Some sure can be tough to persuade. I even used a turkey model once. It didn't seem to know it was destined for stardom. It hopped from the model stand and fluttered around the room, flapping its wings and snapping its beak until it settled down. I hid behind some crates till the coast was clear, wondering if I should have been an animal trainer instead of an artist. But I told myself I was an artist, and I finished the painting at last. Then, suddenly, I was famous. People saw themselves in my pictures. I portrayed average people everyday Americans, sometimes happy and sometimes confronting life's little problems, but always with a bit of humor. What did I paint? Just simple things. A grandfather laughing at, laughing at his look-alike snowman. A schoolgirl waiting outside the principal's office. <laughs> a boy and a girl watching the moon. A scrawny teenager lifting weights. But no matter what I painted, I always was trying to, to show how I saw the world. The truth is, I couldn't paint ugliness. I suppose I painted life like I'd like it to be. As I grew up, I found the world wasn't always a pleasant place. So I decided that even though life wasn't perfect, I'd paint only the ideal aspects of it. That way, my pictures always showed the best side of things. But what should an artist do when war comes? Well, 
I volunteered. I was too old to fight, but I fought with one weapon I had, my art. I made four paintings and called them the Four Freedoms, based on a speech President Franklin D. Roosevelt gave during World War II. I wanted to show what we were fighting for. Freedom of speech and worship, freedom from want and fear. The paintings were exhibited around the country and helped bring in millions of dollars in war bonds. Once I went up with a squad of paratroopers in training. Talk about courage! I watched them leap out one by one from the plane's doorway and into the blue sky as their shoots bloomed open. Geronimo! I had to sketch fast, but I got it all. Hey, I wasn't called the kid with the camera eye for nothing. The war was finally over. The world was changing. Could I change too? My country was struggling with a new issue, freedom for all, white folk and black. People protested, people marched, people died for their beliefs. My large painting, The Problem We All Live With, was my answer. A little black girl in a bright dress walks bravely between four U.S. Marshals. She is entering an all-white school for the first time. On the wall behind her are ugly, hate-filled words and the red splash from a thrown tomato. I wanted my painting to match the power of the moment. I sketched out my idea and had photos taken of several models. But then I hesitated. Would this subject I wondered, go with all my earlier, happier ones. I told myself, if you believe it, Norm, paint it. And the picture got done. Well, time to get to work. I love looking ahead because every painting I make is a new adventure. That's me, by the way, in the picture. I'm just starting on the easel. I'm wrapping a ribbon around America's Liberty Bell. I even use myself as a model now and then. Why not? Saves time and money. And sometimes I just like looking out at viewers from the picture side of the canvas. But I look like, like looking back too, back over my life. When I do, I seem to hear distant voices calling to me. Draw us a picture, Norm. I hear my dad calling. I hear my pals in the old neighborhood calling. I hear my classmates calling. I hear the editors in the post calling. I hear America calling. And you know what? I always did. And that's that story. I goofed. It was it was the Saturday Evening Post, not the New Yorker. That was later on the New Yorker had some this is the post that mom had. I could, you know, and as I read this too, and I remembered, it hit me as I was reading through it this time in my grandmother Walker's house, not the grandma who has all the things here, but my dad's mom, grandma Walker was very mm, reserved, but she had this cool yellow kind of stool that had a, a, the legs came out it, it had a, a high, it was a high bench and it had a seat that came up and it was like a step stool turned into chair and it sat in a certain spot in her kitchen and above that she had a Norman Rockwell Saturday Evening Post cover framed. That's right. Gosh, I wonder where that went. Anyway, um, he lived from... 1894 to 1978. He painted more than 320 covers for the Saturday Evening Post alone. Oh my gosh. Every new picture is a new adventure, he liked to say. The secret is to not look back. Wow. 
Um, he says during Norman's lifetime, art. American art began to change. Abstract art, surrealist art, and other new styles of painting emerged in the 20th century, and the subject matter of many artists became bolder too. But Norman had found his subject and style, and he stayed true to his vision, always continuing to work. Maybe, he quotes is quoted as saying, maybe I, as I grew up and found that the world wasn't the perfectly pleasant place I thought it to be, I unconsciously decided that even if it wasn't an ideal world, it should be. I paint life as I would like it to be. He had three kids. And, you know, this, you can, oh, it's all over the place for that. So, um, in Norman Rockwell's 1938 oil painting titled The Deadline, sometimes called Blank Canvas, done for the Saturday Evening Post cover, an artist sits on a swivel chair in front of more or less empty canvas, scratching his head. Where do I start? Where do I go from here? How many of you guys ever feel like that? Oh. This is amazing. Yes. He was born in New York on February 3rd. He dropped out of high school and began to study art at the National Academy of Design in New York in 1910. And he painted his first commission in 1910. His first of 322 covers for the Saturday Evening Post was in 1916. His first cover is A Boy with a Baby Carriage. May 20th, 1916, and con children continue to be a favorite subject for the years to come. He got married in 1916 and divorced in 1930. In 1930, he married Mary Barstow, and they eventually had three sons. He moved to Arlington, and then he went on to illustrate interior stories for Look Magazine, where he starts to deal with some of his deeper interests. That was in 64. Yeah, <clears throat> and he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977. Pretty cool. Now, there is what I wanted to show you guys. All right, so here we go. Some actual, let me zoom in on these guys. This one is Checkers from 1928. That was a, illustrated a magazine story. Um, this is Freedom from Fear. That was one of the pieces he did for the war in 1943. This is the art critic, or art critic that he did in 1955. He says, perhaps Rockwell painted art critic to respond to some critics who had attacked his work as old-fashioned. The humor here turns on two facts. First, the critic bending over with a magnifying glass seems to be analyzing only a tiny bit of the whole painting. <laughs> and at the same time, the female subject of the painting seems to be glancing down and laughing at the critic. <laughs> um, and here is the one he did in 1964 of all Rockwell's paintings, The Problem We All Live With. And this is his most well-known of all Rockwell's paintings. This depicts a young African-American girl, Ruby Bridges, being escorted to an all-white school. Amazing. And the end papers, just so cool. Saturday Evening Post. Oh, my goodness. Yay. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There you're funny. I'm an American trooper. Uh, you have one in your kitchen? Do you really? Oh, man. I wish I could remember. For some reason, I think the one that Grandma had was one that was um, a uh, the barbershop one. I, you know, the cutting the hair. And because there was a mirror. I don't know. I'll have to ask my sisters if, if they remember which one it was. But it was in Grandma's kitchen. You came in because Grandma's kitchen, the, the back door from the back 
mud, not, not a screened, it was glassed in porch, back mudroom porch you came in. And then you came in the back door into the kitchen. And then right across from that back door was the stairs that went down to this, down to the basement, which was scary. And all heck, they had a coal chute down there. And oh my God. Um, but then just as you came in that back door, just to the left was where that was. And I would sit in it all the time. Yeah, it was fun. And, and that, I remember that, gosh, oh my gosh. Um, that's so cool. Uh, I, and I love the fact that he continued to just, that idea of wanting to put himself inside so he could see out. Oh, you do? You have one of those chairs in you to cut hair? That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Cause I, yeah, that's hilarious. I don't know who had it, got that chair, but I loved it. It was yellow and it, the paint was chipped and oh my gosh, it was great. Oh my gosh. So the next story is really kind of cool because, um, it's called draw what you see the life and art of Benny Andrews. And so Benny Andrews actually does the illustrations of this. I'm going to, it's written by Kathleen Benson. She's the co-author with her late husband, Jim Haskins of many pictures books, including John Lewis in the lead, a story of civil rights, um, which was il illustrated by Benny Andrews, who the book is, uh, this book is about and won the NCSS Carter G Woodson award for the most distinguished social science book for young readers that depicts ethnicity in the United States. She's retired from the Museum of the City of New York, where she lives in Manhattan, and she serves on the boards of several nonprofit arts and community organizations. Now, Benny Andrews um, was a groundbreaking pa painter, author, teacher, and activist who is widely considered to be one of the finest African American artists of the 20th century. His work is included in museum collections around the world. He illustrated more than 20 books for young readers, including Poetry for Young People, Langston Hughes by David Rossell and Arnold Rampenstead, and for which he got a Coretta Scott King illustrator honor. Uh, and very different style of, of painting and far more modern, but um, what I really like, and you'll see in the illustrations of, of this book about himself, that he has using his own style to illustrate his own life. How freaking cool is that? Oh my gosh. So anyway, um, you ready? I'm just checking here. Uh, it is brain shift right there didn't catch up with me. <laughs> what, what I wanted to do, my brain hadn't caught up with what I wanted to do. Huh. So this is draw what you see. Oops, what happened? What happened? Where did it go? Oh, no wonder. There it is. I jumped all over the place. There we go. Here we go. Draw what you see now. Let me just back this up a bit so you can see the whole book. There you go. So you see that the illustrative style already is very different. And what I like about this kind of style that I've been watching and, and trying, I, I did my figure drawing class yesterday. And after reading this book and watching this, I used this kind of looking at like the triangle shape and type of block type shapes and figure drawing. It was, it made it easier for me to put a person together. Not that I was so successful at it, but it was fun. <clears throat> Plus it was Jerry's birthday and he was pretending to be the model. And it was hilarious. Anyway, um, this is ready for the story. Um, draw what you see. The Life and Art of Benny Andrews by Kathleen Benson, illustrated with paintings by Benny Andrews.
New Orleans, Louisiana, 2005. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, whole families lost their homes. People had to live in camps set up by the government or move miles away to stay with relatives or friends. Children had to go to makeshift schools. The artist Benny Andrews traveled from New York City to Louisiana to work with those children. He showed them how to draw pictures of what they had seen, to use art to express their feelings about what they had been through. He knew from his own experience how important this kind of self-expression was. And he knew that sometimes it was easier to tell a story with pictures than with words. Plainview, Georgia, 1933. Benny started to draw when he was three years old. Once he started, he never stopped. At first, he made pictures of the world around him. He drew hot suns and red clay and little wood frame houses in the middle of cotton fields that stretched as far as he could see. He drew black people at work in the fields. Just about everyone Benny knew worked in the cotton fields on farms owned by white people. Every morning except Sunday, they reported to white bosses. Benny's mama and daddy had other jobs too. They had 10 children to feed. On Sundays, the family went to church. Benny loved the colorful hats the women wore. He sang hymns at the top of his voice, swaying with the congregation. When the preacher shouted about suffering and justice, Benny made pictures in his mind. And back home, he drew the church ladies' hats and the preacher's Bible stories. In grade school, Benny was always the class artist. He copied the comics from the daily newspaper. He drew the stories he heard on the radio and the stars in the movies he went to see in town on Saturdays. After school, Benny worked carrying water to the laborers in the fields. At planting and harvest time, he didn't go to school at all. None of the black children did, in Plainview did because they were needed on the farm. Their school year was only about five months long. By the time they were teenagers, most of Benny's friends went to work in the fields full time. But Benny was miserable there. Every row of crops was the same as every other row. The hot sun beat down through the straw hat on his head. The hoe was heavy in his hands. Benny dreamed of leaving. He did not have a clear plan, but he knew the first step was to attend high school. He was glad when his mother made arrangements with their farm's boss, Mr. Will, so he could go. A little more light to that. There you go. Each day, Benny had to walk three miles to high school and then three miles back home, but he knew that there was a bigger world waiting for him beyond the small world of his childhood and that getting an education was the best way to reach it. He wanted to see that world for himself and make pictures of it. Benny graduated from high school, and with a scholarship from the local 4-H club, he went to a small college for black students. Then he joined the Air Force and finally got a chance to travel. The Air Force sent him all over the United States, even to Alaska. During all that time, he never stopped drawing.
When Benny's military service was over, let me get you a close-up of this picture. When Benny's military service was over, the government offered to pay his college tuition. He moved to Chicago to attend art school. It was the biggest city he'd ever seen, full of many different kinds of people, towering buildings, and the best of all, museums. Benny could spend an entire day looking at art if he wanted. He never felt so free. Home was always in his heart, but Plainview, Georgia, and the white bosses and the black farm workers and the crows of crops, all the same, were far behind him now. Benny was inspired by the people around him, and people were what he wanted to draw. He especially liked making paintings of the jazz musicians in the city's many clubs and cafes. He loved meeting them and listening to their music, and he learned how to show the rhythms of their songs in his artwork. With lots of practice, he became a master at capturing movement on the still canvas. Benny also made pictures of the ordinary people he saw, like the janitors who worked at his school. He liked to think of himself as a people's painter, and he discovered that sticking pieces of paper and canvas on his pictures made them seem more textured and real. After art school, Benny moved to New York City and became a working artist. He had so many stories to tell. He began to create a series of paintings about his childhood in Georgia. Making several pictures based on the same theme was a whole new way for him to tell stories with his artwork. He painted the people on the streets of Harlem, the happiness and sadness that he saw, and the demonstrations that mark the beginning of the civil rights movement. Benny fought for equal rights for African Americans, especially artists. He protested against museums and galleries that did not exhibit the work of women and people of color. He formed a group that helped organize exhibitions of artwork by those who were often excluded by the art world. Benny also began to teach, first at a community center and then at a college. He took his students to a prison to teach art to the inmates. He believed that art was for everyone. Benny Andrews worked hard his entire life and all that work paid off. He became a respected artist. His paintings were shown at big museums and art galleries and community centers and colleges. He made pictures for children's books Benny's success made him even more determined to help others and to share his love of art with them. He continued to teach people from many different backgrounds to use art to tell their stories and to start as he did, by drawing what they see. Ah, more about Benny Andrews. Born in 1930 in Plainview, Georgia, Benny Andrews grew up in a time and a place when African Americans were not supposed to dream. But he had a big dreams. He was not supposed to get an education beyond grade school, yet he graduated from high school and college. <coughs> his dreams took him far from the farm, <coughs> where his parents were sharecroppers. But he never forgot where he came from. The segregation and poverty of his childhood informed both his life and his art. When the civil rights movement began to bring change to the United States, particularly in the South, he returned home to see for himself what those changes meant for black people. Many years later, he was honored by his home state with awards and museum exhibitions of his work. He could have refused bitter over his childhood suffering. Instead, he graciously accepted this belated welcome home. Benny Andrews fought hard to change the art world by protesting the exclusion of women and artists of color from museum and gallery collections and exhibitions. 
as visual arts director for the National Endowment of the Arts in Washington, D.C. from 1982 to 1984, he worked to establish a health insurance program and open doors for many underrepresented artists. Wow. When most American artists were painting abstract forms, he chose to paint realistic figural ones. He celebrated his own life and the lives of ordinary people, capturing their images on canvas. He became a teacher both inside and outside the classroom, encouraging students, prisoners, arti fellow artists, and children who had experienced tragedy, tragedy to take ownership of their stories by drawing, painting, and writing about them. He was a people person, and even when he became famous, he always had time for others. Ah, oh, wow. Let's see. He's just trying to see. And he died in 2006 of cancer at his home in New York. So they used his paintings for this. Oh, I like that one. Oh. Yeah, an old man. Artists aren't always activists. Kudos, Benny. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, in 2005, he goes down and teaches the kids after Katrina about that and that he dies from cancer in 2006 but I I his the type of art he has I mean oh you guys can't see that that's terrible never mind it's hard to see on that one no reflections yeah go back to my other camera you can see it better there see it's just that figural aspect of it and I can see how he would have used collage and adding other things to it for texture this one that he has of the cotton of these center pictures like this just fascinating here in Washington we have um, we had my friend and my mentor Art Wolf um, studied under Jacob Lawrence at the University of Washington and Jacob Lawrence is also another very well-known um, African-American artist, American artist that's another way up there. He taught art, fine art, at the University of Washington for years. And, um, and just very different styles, but I can see the connection in some ways. Um, he was honored as an artist of the year by the Studio Museum in Harlem in 1993. And all kinds. Of, I would love to see some of his work. The Brooklyn Museum had an exhibit of his work um, at the uh, 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. <clears throat> wow. So this tells a little bit about some of those. Um, the front jacket is called Umbrellas. And then Cotton Moment monument was one the soil down the road oil on canvas black church corner greeters writing to dr martin luther king which is uh, 15 and then um the promised land reception study the cotton club harlem usa yeah wonderful oh those are just fun yeah, the painting of the musicians. That's why I put that jazz thing in at the beginning. That was what that was all about. Um, good. So that was the whole purpose of that opening in the opening um, video was to have the Norman Rockwell type stuff and then the Benny Andrews type stuff. I did that with the text to image. Um, kind of came up with those in the Canva text to image, the AI that made up the pictures. It was kind of fun to do. Anyway, that was that story. So I'm excited. I hope it gave you guys some inspiration too, a different kind of things. These, 
I know I kind of it kind of goes through quickly on some of them. If you ever want me to go back and spend some more time around a picture, just holler in the chat and I'll take us back to that page. Um, glad to, but that. That is, that's kind of where I, I realize now where when I was at the figure drawing class, you, sometimes you don't know where your inspiration or your ideas come from. But when I was at that figure drawing class yesterday, I started to put those shapes in for the body and then the, you know, and the things that this, and I see now that it was from looking at this book. That was probably where I got that from. I'm glad you like them. Another night of being enriched by amazing artists in this country. <clears throat> those paintings of musicians has the flavor of the twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Beatles cover art. Yeah. Kind of. All those cover art is a whole thing. Larry, you, I mean, I don't know it. You probably are like Bob, um, know all the cover art and all the artists. Bob always had the, the liners and all the, the notes, the liner notes, I think is what's called knew all that stuff, but the cover art, I mean, you probably have all that kind of information. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm glad you like them both. Yay. And you're bucket overflowing and you love them both. You guys, I'm glad you like them. Um, they were fun. They were fun. And Norman Rockwell, it sounds like he was like he, like his art, like he was like his art, like he was just as fun and, um, and, and almost uh, just optimistic that I think that's what the thing about Norman Rockwell's art, what is always, I think is so beloved because he always had a true sense of optimism about it. And, um, I mean, even the ones that it did, he just, he, he still had a color to, and a tone to it that gave that possibility of something, something positive. Yeah. Well, I don't have to look very far for the possibility of something positive. I just go look in these notes here or these, this chat here of positive people here, you know, yeah, the bucket filler brigade has filled my bucket to overflowing once again. Yay. You guys, thank you so much. Um, another couple books that I probably might not have spent a lot of time with, would have maybe read them, but not really spent the kind of time. And then the memories that it comes back. And when I remember that crazy yellow chair, and now I want to come to Larry's and sit in his. <laughs> but I'm not going to let him cut my hair. No. <laughs> um, yeah, the other, so I am heading to Tacoma tomorrow. I'm going to second use tomorrow afternoon, Larry and Angie. Uh, they have a, um, uh, a toolbox, a craftsman multi-thing toolbox, uh, a vintage one um, in good condition. And I have it on hold because it's going to, fit my paintbrushes and everything just and those suckers are expensive new and to find things something that will work I love old toolboxes and this one if it's gonna work it's gonna be great because it's only 26 inches wide 15 inches high and 12 inches deep and that will be perfect for when I built the when the art shed gets built yay anyway uh, beautiful sunshiny day tomorrow is supposed to be even warmer and I don't know how it is for you guys, where you are, but I sure hope um, that whatever you're up to for the rest of the evening and for tomorrow, that it brings you some joy and that you embrace all of those wonderful things and just always remember that you guys absolutely make my evening and make each day spectacular for me. And it means the world to me. Absolutely means the world to me. And you guys are so spectacular. I have the best bucket filling brigade in the entire 
YouTube universe and beyond. So that's, and, and, you know, I'm, I got the on off button here. So what I say goes and that's believe it. So Sunday, <clears throat> I don't care if you think you're it, it, what I want to see art from everybody for Sunday, whether, you know, I get the should and the just give them a fond farewell barrier. Those two words, burial of should and just, I, I should, or not quite. No, uh, -uh. we all love it. Just do. And we want to see spread the joy, spread the love and send it over. And we'll watch it on Sunday for live story and art with some show and tell shenanigans. How's that sound? And that's about as much as I can talk for now. <laughs> All right, you guys, <sighs> take care. Really have a great evening and the great rest of your week. And I will hopefully see you on Sunday. And until next time, you know the drill. Keep looking for the beauty hidden in plain sight. It's all around you. But we all know if you just go look in the mirror, you'll see that beauty looking right back at you. Yep. Until Sunday. I'll talk to you later. Bye. I'm not letting you cut my hair. Feeling alright. We won't go home. We will just stay here downtown. There's not just stars on the boulevard. They're in the light in your eyes. Oh, we don't need no black cards. I just need you by my side. We could be shameless, famous, and good and cool. And Linda says and she Linda forgot to take it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll find it. I will find it. Ah, she forgot. No, okay. I'll give you the benefit. She forgot. But I'll find it. We could be famous. <laughs> Okay, I won't wait till Sunday. That means I have to open my email before Sunday. <laughs> oh my dad. My email. 1,134 messages. <laughs> That's in junk mail. Hey, you're we welcome, Mr. No Mr. Larry. I just need you by my side. We Crack mirrors still work. These curls can really confound somebody with Dancing girl. <laughs> <laughs>